Hello and welcome to the Qubit Guy podcast, brought to you by Classic, the quantum algorithm design company. My name is Yuval, and my guest today is Sergio Gago, CEO of Capitan Quantum. Sergio and I talk about quantum APIs, how to find the best cloud provider and quantum hardware for a particular quantum algorithm, the price of quantum computing, and much more. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please let us know how we did by emailing hello at classic.io. That's hello at classiq.io. Hello, Sergio, and thanks for joining me today. Hi, Duval. Good morning. Thank you for, invi- for inviting me. So who are you and what do you do? Well, my name is Sergio. I've been a, a CTO in classical companies for a couple of decades, uh, both my own companies and others, both in startups, scale-ups, and, and, and corporates. And I joined what you would call recently, uh, about two years ago, uh, so in the, in the biggest scheme of things of PhDs around us is nothing, I joined the, the quantum computing uh, world. And I joined that by uh, creating a company called Capitan Quantum. Okay. And what does Capitan Quantum do? So Capitan Quantum tries to leverage the same thing that we've seen in the world of AI in the last couple of decades or so by standing on top of shoulders of giant shoulders, as, as they say. And what we try to do is follow the same paradigm that we've been seeing at the begin since the beginning of times in, in, in this sort of world. So at the beginning, you needed a lot of system administrators, data scientists, data engineers, ML ops, all these type of roles and profiles, trying to put their models and systems in your colos and try to get data sets and try to build models and inferences. And it was extremely costly. And in many cases, you would not even get proper inferences, either because you didn't have enough compute power or you didn't have enough data sets. So that probably sounds familiar to the stage we are now at the moment in in quantum computing, right? We have algorithms, we have lots of research done, but we need more people. We need more qubits or less noisy qubits, and we need more algorithms. Therefore, I believe we are a little bit, people say that we are at the ENIAC levels or in the late 60s if we compare quantum with classical. I like to think that we are more like in the 90s in the world of AI and hopefully without an AI winter in the middle. Why? Because in the, in the world of AI, then suddenly cloud computing came. And it was much easier to build models and create open source libraries like the ones we have in Python and create community that accelerated, accelerated uh, uh, very, very fast the development of that industry. All cloud uh, providers created their own different layers like uh, AWS, GCP, Azure. And today you have plenty of SaaS solutions. You don't need to, to build your own system. If you want a spam or not, check it. Or, or a natural language processing system, you don't need your own model or your own data set. You just have an API and then get the results from that. Now, of course, if you are uh, live in a very specific business, you can go for that and, 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 and build it yourself. But it, for the 99% of the clients out there, of the requirements and problems out there, the out-of-the-box solution will be enough. In quantum computing, we're going in the same direction. If you're a big bank, or a big pharma company, probably you are going to need, or you should be already hiring quantum engineers, building your your internal knowledge and, and building capacity and, and, and get support of some of the companies in, in our industry around us. But if you're a smaller hedge fund, you should still be able to get the benefits of say portfolio optimization or credit risk analysis without having the resources of do scouting with some of the, what, 300, 400 startups in the, in the quantum world today. That is exactly what we're doing at Capitan Quantum. Follow that model on AI and build what we're considering the, the first marketplace of quantum APIs in a way that any customer can run a very simple API request for any domain specific problem whether it's protein folding, credit risk, uh, 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 portfolio optimization, any of the typical uh, uh, use cases that we see today every day in the in the quantum computing world. And then the client will be able to get the state of the art, the best potential solution that we have today for the problem size that he brings. 
Now, if he wants to solve a portfolio optimization for 20,000 assets, probably a quantum, a quantum computer will not cut it yet. It will need to be a few years until we are in that state. Uh, but there are many classical solutions that provide good results. Once those quantum solutions come, and really the question is whether it will be two, three, five, ten years, then those solutions will be out of the box for the client as well in this marketplace. So when you say marketplace, does that mean that you guys are not the only ones developing quantum APIs for the marketplace that you expect to bring in um, algorithms or APIs from other companies? Or at the moment, is it just a Capitan that's doing the development? I think that there's a few people trying similar things. And, and that's really good news for the industry. We have, a, a, of course, people like like Zapata with their frameworks, you, uh, QCWare, Strangeworks. You guys are classic as well. We all live in the in this edge of the of the value chain for the customers, trying to provide better solutions to the quantum developers, to the algorithm developers, to provide value to the final client. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the hardware providers, and right in the middle are the algorithm developers. I think it really depends on where you want to sit in that in that value chain. And we want to be not just qubit agnostic, but solution agnostic. So at the end of the day, if you're a quantum developer, either yeah, one of these 350 quantum consulting companies that are today around the world, instead of spending time and money on commodities, which is how do I run my algorithms? They have to go somewhere beyond your Jupyter notebook uh, or your demo or your paper. You have to productize them. When you face that problem, you have two options. Either you hire a system administrator or several, some backend, classical backend developers, someone to manage your infrastructure, and then you start doing integrations. That's perfectly fine, perfectly uh, doable, but that's reinventing the wheel over and over again. What we're doing is saying, okay, just put your algorithm in this box and it will run out it will run automatically with governance, compliance, control, billing, security, all those issues that are not your core business. Because what you do well is develop state algorithms. And that is the the angle that, that we are taking. Other companies take different angles, and I think we are all approaching a sweet spot. On, on, on providing additional value into the into the industry, but we try we try to go as far as possible in the in the value chain in a way that there's going to be 10, 15, 20 different ways of solving a specific problem. And which one does the client want? The cheapest, the fastest, or the most accurate? Or a combination of the three, and we we're able to say, well, your uh, problem, your best solver is going to be using an annealer, or using an ion trapped computer by developer A or developer B, or using a superconducting qubit, or maybe something that pops up next year that no one knows about, and that's the value that we're trying to provide. Could you give me an example of APIs that you offer today? I think I can think about random number generation as a easy API that may be something that you can get almost instantaneously. But what other APIs do you offer today? Yeah, so the, the quantum number, random number generation is like a, like our Hello World program is what we use to teach the, the algorithm developers how to use the platform and how to upload a new solver, as we call them, into the platform. The solver is linked to a domain problem. It could be finance, could be pharma, it could be others. So we cover the, the three typical ones in, in finance, uh, currency arbitrage, credit risk, and, uh, and portfolio optimization. And then we uh, uh, provide uh, uh, variational algorithms for chemistry problems. And we offer QML algorithms for class classification. But really what matters is how can you put your algorithms in the system? In order to do that, we have three frameworks that allow the developer to do this in a much, much quicker way. So for example, the, the one that's most, most advanced and the one that provides better solutions today is a Cubo framework. A lot of combinatorial problems can be modeled in, in the shape of a Cubo. So as long as you can map your problem or your algorithm in the, in the quadratic binary form, everything else is taken care of for you. So no matter how many uh, providers come afterwards, uh, 
it co it goes directly into the platform so you don't have to choose vendor a or vendor b it's already embedded into it you can build it from scratch as well if you want put in your own uh, um, a account with uh, whichever hardware company you want, but you can also leverage these frameworks and these SDKs that reduce your development time to the very minimum, but also to the thing that matters. So to answer your question, we're not really developing new algorithms, and that drives my team nuts because they are quantum engineers, but we are not creating new science here. Uh, um, I don't think I'm smart enough to do that myself. Uh, what we're doing is trying to leverage those who create these new signs, these new algorithms, and create a benchmark platform for them to use it. So the API platform is the long-term uh, project for us, is the, is the long-term game. But it will be some time until we reach that state. At the end of the day, who wants to use an API to solve a portfolio optimization of 50, 60, 80 assets? What we're doing today is speaking with some of these 300, 350, 400 quantum uh, consulting companies and telling them, look, you are building your own algorithms. You want to benchmark your solutions against other solutions, classical, quantum, or otherwise. And you also want to distribute them. What if instead of spending valuable time on doing this commodity platform or architecture, let me just plug in my platform in your cloud provider, colo, anywhere you want, and you just have to work on your algorithm. The only thing you need to give your client is this endpoint, this API, that allows them to build any custom model that you that you work with. And that's really the focus that we have during 2021. Certain quantum algorithms can run on different quantum computers. Not every algorithm can run on every computer, but depending on the number of qubits and the connectivity and so on and so on, and different cloud providers and different quantum hardware providers have different pricing. How do you choose the best provider and best hardware for a particular client? That's, that, that, that's a really good question. And it, it took us quite some time to figure out the model of prioritizing solvers. So imagine we have, for some specific problems, we have 20, 25 different solvers different algorithms that solve the same problem. And some of them are classical. So they run in a normal CPU, in a normal computer, and they fight against other quantum algorithms. And as you say, if you try to solve it this way, with this amount of qubits or with this topology of qubits, you're going to be able to solve a problem this big or this small. Uh, now, if the problem is small, the accuracy might be much better. If the problem is bigger, yes, you can, you can encode more data, but the accuracy may be, may be uh, 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 suffers a little bit. So we've created a benchmark model based on three variables, cost, time, and accuracy. And then a combination, a weighted combination of, of them all. What we see is that some people tell us, well, I'm not really looking for the most accurate solution, as long as it's decent, but I'm looking for something more real time. Uh, or on the contrary, I want something that's incredibly accurate. I don't mind how much it costs as long as you give me the best solution of them all. So this allows us to do things like, let me run your problem against the 20 or 25 solvers. And some of them will take longer than others because yeah, there's queues and, and things like that. So sometimes the final client takes three hours to get the answer back of all the solvers, but he will get the histogram of all the different options, all the different solvers fighting against each other and ranking against each other. Maybe someone says, I want just the cheapest option. Maybe my option requires spinning up uh, hundreds of servers to, to train a neural network and then use the model to create inferences, the classical AI way. And that's going to cost some money as well. Uh, or you can run this less accurate version on this specific computer that runs for cheaper, uh, at least on, 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 the, on the algorithmic time. So we can allow the customer to decide what is their priority or just use our ensemble model to get what's the best of breed solution as we move forward. Now, what's interesting is how our industry is evolving. For example, we, today we use variational algorithms because that's one of the best solutions we have for the NISC era when we have noisy computers with not a lot of qubits. But 
is that model going to work to the same, say, in five years from now or even in three years from now? I think that that we will change a lot the type of algorithms that we use when, when we don't have the same limitations that we have today. So maybe variational algorithms become a thing of the past. And maybe someone will hate me for saying this or someone who's uh, building their postdoc on, on, on that. That's building the machine that we are trying to build today. So that's needed. And, and we need to go step by step. But I don't think we will be using variational algorithms in 10 years from now. So all this work that we have invested in the platform, is it wasted? No, because you have an abstracted layer that works on, on, on that abstracts you from that, that hides you from all that complexity. So just to clarify what I think I heard. So if I have an algorithm, I could submit it to you. You could initially run it in the example that you gave on 20, 25 different algorithms. You would give me a report showing the cost and performance and response time of each. And then based on that, I can choose the best algorithm for me and then use that in production. Is that about right? That's one way of working, but the most common way is just saying, I want to solve this problem. Give me the best solution you have. And I will give you one and just one, uh, one solution. Then maybe in five months time, there's a new algorithm using a new computer by some hardware provider or an algorithm that has been updated by the developer, and it will start ranking higher. Imagine like the like Google search results. That's a dynamic thing, and 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 it's alive, and results keep changing for a specific keyword. So as the consumer, the end consumer, you will just integrate with this API. This API has a specific contract, and you can integrate with your own pipelines. You're going to get the best of breed solution from all the platform. Now, what you can do as well is exactly what you say: give me everything. And I will decide which one, which result I want to keep. So it becomes effectively a benchmarking platform that you can use to say, hey, com please compare for me all the different solvers, annealing, superconducting, using company A, company B, company, company C, <clears throat> for this specific same problem for everyone. Now, of course, the same algorithm can be implemented in different ways. So you can have... One company, say, focus on the financial industry who uses one well-known published algorithm that performs better than another company just because they've done some fine-tuning or tweaking on, on their solver. That's fine, and that is something that we, want to, that we want to leverage as well. That's from the end consumer. Now, if you're an algorithm developer, you look at the platform from the other side, at the marketplace from the other side. I can see all the problems that are available on the platform or even suggest new problems, domain problems. And I can say, here's my solver for this problem. I'm going to get the, deta the details, the data from the user in this way, in this format. I can use these frameworks that I mentioned before, or build my own thing from scratch, put it in the platform, and then we're going on a revenue share on each API call that we, that we execute. You can use our own agreements with the hardware providers, or you can use your own. It depends on, on, on your own uh, uh, requirements and the, and the final company and the hardware provider as well. And then your solver comes into the platform. What can happen? Maybe in one year time, your solver becomes obsolete because the hardware platform you're running it is no more. We see this pretty much every, every month or every quarter, hardware companies deprecate their, their systems. Or they change the way their queue processes, or they change the way they build. Many things can change. So the only thing you need to do is make a new commit to your repository, your GitHub repository, and that automatically updates the system in the platform and validates it and builds it. It becomes effectively a continuous integration platform for your quantum algorithms as well. So you can use it as testing, benchmark, delivery, distribution. Let's talk a little bit about predictions. Um, when you look at the classical world and, and the big cloud providers, AWS or Azure or Google Cloud, you can use their services in multiple ways. One is you can just buy capacity. Oh, I want an EC2 server and, and that's it. Or you can use an API for NLP or for uh, geotagging or uh, whatever mm -hmm. it is. 
Which do you think will become the prevalent option for quantum? Is it selling capacity or is it selling API that performs a certain quantum service? I think at the end of the day, everything is selling capacity. When you look at it from the cloud provider perspective, so take AWS, for example, and, and that's actually one of the, the stories I use for, for explaining Capitan. You could use SageMaker, there's this tool for data scientists to just build their notebooks and their models, and you don't need system administrators. Or you can just go and integrate with these APIs to do NLP or to do text, uh, any type of text analysis, text to speech or uh, speech to text, uh, transcription, all these type of things. But at the end of the day, what AWS wants is you using their servers with different layers of, of abstraction and, and different layers of, of uh, building business corporate lock-ins. But at the end of the day, you're using their servers. You can build, uh, you, you can pay by machine uh, minute, you can pay by a script executed, you can pay by API, like in the world of, of serverless. But it, in the end, everything is selling capacity. And I think the big players, the ones you mentioned and, and, and beyond, they're in that game on building logins and creating their own modes. So we buy their capacity, at least until we figure out what's going to be the winning architecture that takes them all. There's uh, at the end of the day only one. Okay, superconductors win, or or, fo or photonic uh, computers win. Maybe there's one, maybe there's two, maybe there's several. But I think it's safe to assume that there's going to be at least uh, there's going to be one, maximum two archi dominant architectures in quantum computers. Yeah. Whether that's going to be in five, ten, or fifteen years, I won't yeah, <laughs> I won't risk to to to, to make it that. Um, so. What AWS, Google, in a more uh, a bit more shy, IBM, of course, what they're doing is placing their bets and trying to sell capacity. On the other side of the spectrum, if you're a consultant, if you're a, a quantum consulting company, you play with the same economics, with the same numbers that classical software consulting companies. A little bit more risky with a little bit more uncertainty, but at the end of the day, the economics are the same. You're selling quantum engineers. Try to productize it as best as possible. Try to uh, optimize your processes and productize some things and, 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 and abstract some things, but you're selling projects, time and materials, if you will. Uh, so right in the middle is selling APIs. What we're trying to sell is not a, a capacity. We're trying to sell intelligence uh, on demand. So the capacity is still there. And IBM will sell their quantum minutes and Google and AWS, and they will build their own computers. Then the consulting companies will build better algorithms, will build better modes, will get bigger contracts, but still they rely on the hardware providers. I think right in the middle, is where companies like like a classic, like strange works, like like uh, people like us try to make a difference on how to bring those two together. And if you're thinking about next year, about 2022, what would your predictions be for quantum computing industry in 2022? That's a tough one uh, because then you can you can come back to the podcast and be listen and say, "Oh, look at that guy! <laughs> he, he was completely <laughs> clueless and on what he was saying." Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll make a bet. I think considering how how exponentially is everything we're doing, how many people is now working on 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 our industry and creating breakthroughs all the time, I think we're going to be very creative on finding not necessarily quantum advantage. Or, or, or uh, quantum supremacy in the in the sense of it, but we will start seeing benefits of incorporating quantum algorithms into systems. Again, from from the scientific perspective, from the research perspective, we talk about uh, great uh, degrees of, of of magnitude better, right? This has to be exponentially better, exponentially faster, exponentially cheaper. But there is a lot of gray in the middle when. Yeah, you don't have to be necessarily better than your classical counterpart, but you're actually better for the environment, or you're cheaper to execute, or you don't need as much footprint, or you're a little bit more accurate, or you can combine things uh, together. And there's a lot of research and, and studies 
popping up now on, 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 on that integration. I think that's what we will start seeing next year. That from the, from the say, scientific side. Then from the industry side, I believe we're going into consolidation. So my, my bet is that there's going to be quite a few more movements like the ones we've seen already this year on, 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 on companies getting together, doing more things together, either temporarily for public funds, if you will, or for longer periods uh, like mergers, acquisitions, and, and whatnot, and growth on the investment side. So a bright future, I think. Excellent. So as we get closer to the end of our discussion, I have one more question on pricing. Do you feel that the pricing, the price of quantum computer or the price of using a quantum computer is already competitive to the point where people can start thinking about moving into production? Or is it just totally expensive and it's just a uh, an exploration at this point? I, I would say the latter. It's pure explorative or it's building blocks. Uh, doing executing quantum algorithms is very expensive, not just because of the pay per minute, uh, of, the, of the cost per minute that you can have on running your algorithms, but it's on who's running them and how this is changing. But your model today is going to be completely outdated in three months. When someone publishes a new paper, destroying the algorithm you used before and, and proposing something completely different. And that's fine. That's that's how you how you run in deep tech and, and how you advance the the industry. But in that sense is it's actually more expensive based on that uncertainty than on the minute price uh, per se or in the platform price. Now you have to do it because you have to keep moving uh, or, or, or keep keep running one one step at a time. So all in all, it is expensive. It's only for, I guess, bigger companies at the moment. What we're trying to do is democratize it or humanize it so smaller companies and everyone can get the benefit of quantum when uh, we reach that, that inflection point. So Sergio, how can people get in touch with you to learn more about your work? Sure. Uh, so you can find me easily on, on LinkedIn. I'm Sergio Gago. Uh, you can find a, a Capitan with obviously with a Q, Capitan.com on, on on our company. You can also follow me on Twitter at uh, at Pirate CTO. Uh, that's what I've been doing for for a while. And uh, yeah, if you put Sergio Gago, I'm easy to find. That's excellent. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Jubal, for inviting. Pleasure to be here.